Well, John, uh, first thing I want to know about uh, Stan and Ollie is um, how did you come to Steve Coogan for Stan Laurel? Um, well, Steve was a hero of mine growing up, you know, he did Alan Partridge, uh, which was a huge thing in the UK. When I was at university, I used to watch that regularly. Um, and, um, you know, I knew that Steve was a fantastic mimic uh, and obviously a great actor. And we, and, and we needed someone who had uh, the comedy chops, who had the ability for physical comedy um, and also who could you know who, who who had the weight of the of of the of the of the drama as well um so he was an ideal choice um and and that's really why we you know why we came to him uh and he was our first choice for for stan laurel as john was with for for or oliver hardy yeah well tell me about john too i mean on on spec you don't think he, he looks like oliver hardy at all how did you envision you and the hair and makeup team costume designers and so forth making him disappear so much into this role. Well, what we did with John is, I mean, John is, you know, one of the best actors in the world. You know, there's just no question about it. And we knew that he could pretty much, do, his range is, 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 is unparalleled, really. Um, so we knew he could do it. We just had to build this sort of person around him. Uh, so we did a lot of sort of computer tests where, uh, you know, put in, proposed prosthetics on him and, and built it up around what would he look like with prosthetic on. Um, and it didn't take too long actually to, to, to get him looking like Oliver Hardy on, 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 on a computer screen. Uh, so we knew it was possible and we knew he was a fantastic actor, then it was just about, I mean I asked him to put on weight at the beginning and, and he was less keen on doing that so we had to find uh, a prosthetic fat suit and, and, and have that made and it was a huge long process. but. Luckily, we had Mark Coulier, who is one, if not the best prosthetic guys in the world, who's, who's won two Academy Awards before. So we were, we were coming at it from a very high uh, caliber in terms of prosthetic, yeah. Uh, were you a big Stan uh, Laurel and Oliver Hardy fan? I was a huge Laurel and Hardy fan. I was a fan since I was eight years old. Uh, I've got uh, a picture of me dressed as Stan Laurel for the uh, school fancy dress party. Um, so there's proof there actually that that um, that I did love them, you know. So it was been a long love affair for me with these two guys. Um, so when I got the opportunity, when I read Jeff's script, um, I jumped at the chance because it was like a childhood dream come true, you know, getting to work with my heroes. Tell me about the opening sequence. Um, anytime anybody takes on a long trekking shot uh, across, uh, basically in this case, across an entire studio walkway. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then into the studio. I mean, any one little thing goes wrong. One extra walks the wrong way or turns. Yeah. I mean, you have to, you know, start over again. Did was it important to you to make that the opening sequence? Well, what actually happened was uh, the very first script we had. The opening sequence was well, the opening scene was nine pages of dialogue in the dressing room. So we had to find a way of getting it up on its feet, and we built that idea slowly. Uh, we built a miniature of the studio and we, and we worked it out like with military precision where, would, where everybody would be. Uh, we only had one day to shoot it, so we had to be incredibly prepared. Um, and I also uh, took the advice of Mr. Scorsese. He, he became a friend of mine a few years ago when I worked with him on a show called Vinyl. And he's been a great mentor for me over the years and, and obviously had done good fellas and influenced a lot of uh, the big steady cam shots that have come since then. Um, so I used Mr. Scorsese as, as, a, as, a, as a mentor and, and asked him about lens choice and, and you know, keeping things moving and, and we did 18 takes of that opening shot and we, you, we used the very last one and I don't think Steve or John dropped one line in 18 takes of nine pages of dialogue, which is an incredible achievement, yeah. One thing we see right away with Oliver Hardy and, and, and I had seen a lot of their work but I didn't know a lot about them personally but you can see right away how much the people on the set and other people around him just loved him. He's, he was so charming yeah. and such a nice guy, which is a little bit opposite of the character he would play on, on film. Yeah, I, that's why I thought was, was incredibly interesting when I first read the script was that they were both very opposite to what they were on screen. Stan was a very serious um Serious about his work, I should say, not a serious guy. Serious about his work, was a workaholic. Didn't really have that many interests outside work. But Oliver Hardy was. Um, he was a very keen gambler. He would go to the the horse racing quite a lot. 
Uh, but the but the lovely thing I, I found out about Ollie was he was a real keen golfer, and he was one of the best golfers in Hollywood. They say uh, he used to win all the the, the celebrity tournaments. Um, and for a man that size, for a man who was two, three hundred pounds, whatever he was at the various stages of his life, to be that skilled in a game like golf, I thought was 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 quite beautiful, quite tragic as well, though, because uh, the studio kept feeding him. You know, they they kept they they wanted to keep him at that weight. Um, so uh, there's a beauty and a tragedy about Oliver Hardy that I think people really respond to. Yeah, I just was talking to Steve, and we talked about this. I, so many duos in film history or TV history. I'm thinking of like Jerry Lewis, Dean Martin, um, Tommy Smothers and Dick Smothers, and then yeah. Laurel and Hardy, now that I know this story more. The foolish, the more foolish, the uh, the one that's sort of put upon is often the, the brains of the outfit. And, and I guess you discovered that as well. Yeah, exactly. It, it, was, it, was, it was a shock to me that that was the case. And they say that Stan used to sleep in the um, in his uh, in the edit. You know, he would never really go home. Uh, he would he would actually a funny thing I, I learned about Stan was he because he used to direct as well, and he would keep and Ollie would want to leave. Ollie would want to go and play golf or go to the racetrack, but Stan would keep him behind. So he would get more frustrated and more frustrated and more frustrated. And those incredible looks that you see in their movies of Ollie being so uptight and so at the end of his tether with Stan, sometimes used to come from the fact that Stan was keeping him from going to do his uh, uh, after curricular activities. Yeah. One thing I also liked about several scenes was that beyond the filmed stuff or the stage stuff, when that when you see them in private moments or checking into the hotel or yeah. the luggage going down the steps, you were able to incorporate the routine routine and that relationship within their own personal lives. Yeah, that was something that came near the end of the process. We wanted to get the script right so it could have worked as a story about any two friends who just happened to be these famous guys. Um, and then we obviously had all the stage routines done and we thought just as an extra layer to make it work on on a layer for the really true fans we wanted to to show that to show that Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy were always on whatever they were doing they were always on whether they were entertaining their fans whether they were entertaining members of the public whether they were even entertaining each other uh, as you see in some of the scenes in, in, in the movie so that was almost like the sprinkling um, to the finished uh, to the finished um, project you know to the finished draft of the script that was a, that was the chocolate sprinkles on the top just given those people who knew their, their their films so well that extra level that extra little sort of nugget you know of all the scenes you shot was what was a favorite of yours i think my favorite scene um was the was the was the conversation at dinner between the wives and uh, Stan and Ollie. So between Eden and Lucille and Stan and Ollie, is this great? There's two double acts going on there, and, and it's when we first are introduced to the wives, and we realise that they're going to be a double act within their own right. Yeah, um, and that that's really was, and it was a scene that had a lot of production value, had a lot of depth, um, had a lot of humour. Um, it's not particularly complicated in terms of how you cover it, uh, but just just actually enjoying seeing it being performed and seeing the dynamic come to life, not only between Steve and John, but between, you know, Nina and Shirley. Uh, that was that was something that I that I that I will always remember, yeah. What is the trick from a directing standpoint when you've got in this case it's a foursome and you've got overlapping dialogue, you've got people speaking over each other, uh, you've got, like you said, a couple of conversations going on. What's the trick to shooting that? Well, I, I, I really hate overlapping dialogue. That's one of my pet hates. I don't like improvisation that much as well. I'd, I'd love to improvise in, on, uh, in rehearsals and, 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 and get the script so tight that the actors know it so well. It's like a dance and they're, and they're bouncing around each other. You know? So I will, try and, I will try and take all the overlaps out at, at all. I mean, you can do it in post as well, but I try and get it on set so they're so... They know the they know the material so well that they don't have to um, uh, struggle and overlap. Because I always find that when you see actors overlap, the, 
depending on the style of film, but on, in, a, in a movie like this, it just takes you out of the film. Um, so rehearsal is the key for me. Mm. Rehearsal, making sure the actors are comfortable in what they're saying, they're happy in what they're saying, and if they do have any notes for you, make sure that they tell you up before you start shooting. Yeah. It's like a choreography then on, of, of dialogue. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a, it's, you know what it's like. It's like creating a stage play. Mm. Uh, it's like creating a stage play, so they know it so well uh, that they know each other's breath, they know each other's beat. Uh, it's like a dance, yeah, and and that's how I that's how I look at it, yeah. Well, America and the UK and the worldwide, they're about to see this film. Good luck with it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your uh, interest in it.